Today we are going to talk about Zomato and their billing platform. Zomato is one of the largest food and grocery delivery companies in India. And let's talk about their story of transition from TyDB to DynamoDB. And this brought them 90% reduction in latency and 50% cost savings. This is an image of the architecture of Zomato's billing system. This billing system provides ledgers and payouts for all their businesses. It serves over a million payments on a weekly basis, a million payments. So storing the payment ledgers is a mission critical database requirement. Now this architecture is basically a bunch of services with Kafka queues in between. The microservices architecture doesn't really matter to us right now. Let's just zoom into the database. They use TiDB, so let's talk a bit about it. Now TiDB is a distributed SQL database. You can communicate with it like you do with MySQL using the same clients and the same drivers. It is distributed, so you can add more nodes to it as your scale requires. We don't really need to understand how TiDB works internally. But let's just see some of its capabilities and its basic components. These are the four components. There is the TIDB server, which provides the MySQL layer for the cluster, um, the SQL layer basically. There is the placement driver server, which has the metadata and it decides where to store the data or which server to store the data in. Then there is the TIKV servers, which stores the data. The data is actually internally stored in a key value store in RocksDB, which is a embedded key value store. And TiDB builds the SQL and the transaction layer on top of that. So that is the value of TiDB. The data is synced between these nodes using Raft. To know more about Raft, you can watch my video on it. Shameless plug here. I will link it in the description. An interesting thing is that TiDB also provides OLAP features on analytical features. Uh, they have a separate server for these to store this kind of data called TI Flash. TI Flash stores data in columnar format, which is better for analytical data processing. Now, why am I mentioning all these features? To tell you that TiDB is not a bad database at all, but Zomato's team faced some challenges in the particular scenario. What's interesting is how they were using TiDB. When they started using it, there was no cloud TiDB offering. So they have their own managed cluster. While this might be great in some use cases, this is what mainly brought them their woes. So it started to get more complex as the scale grew and number of nodes grew. Like when they added a large node to the cluster, that node became the primary for write operations. So all the write operations happened through that node and latencies grew larger because that node has to now serve all the write operations. Now when they predicted high traffic, they would manually scale up the cluster and it would be over provisioned or they would have more servers or more capacity than required. And this would be for some time. This would increase the costs. They had to do all the operations like monitoring, backups, version upgrades. All this became hard. Now one can argue that if they build tools and platforms around TiDB, they could have mitigated these issues. Like let's say they build some kind of sophisticated auto scaling. But this is much effort didn't really make sense for Zomato to invest in. Since that's not really their point of business, so they wouldn't want to do much in that part. These reasons pointed them to DynamoDB. The main thing is now the work of scaling and managing the database and the clusters would be with AWS and not them. It would make sure that latencies remain constant. They do not need to worry about provisioning the right amount of servers. So their movement is from managing everything on their own to a managed solution and also on a different kind of database. This is not a correct solution for everyone. But for the particular scenario, this works. Another problem they actually had with TiDB turned out to be its relational nature. They struggled with schema changes and migrations. DynamoDB is a NoSQL key value store. So they didn't need to worry much about schema migrations now, since there is no concept of a fixed schema table as such. In DynamoDB, they put the data in one single table. Look at this structure and how the keys are declared on the table. We would discuss how they uh, thought about these keys later. And the rest of the data that they had in the tables is put as data attributes in DynamoDB. An attribute is like a column's value in a row in DynamoDB. They used a pattern called adjacency list pattern that is used to convert tables with many to many relationships into DynamoDB data format. Remember your data structure is learning. When you use a graph, you can represent that as an adjacency list where each node is a key and you put the nodes it is connected to as a list with that. Similarly, we would represent the table relationships as an adjacency key. 
but the primary key or the secondary keys of that adjacency list would be the key of the uh, uh, table in DynamoDB and the data associated with it would be the data attributes. We will add all the data associated with the key in one row even if it's from multiple tables. Now to specify the key in DynamoDB, you have to give a partition key and optionally a sort key. Now the partition key determines how your data is partitioned or how your data is distributed across the nodes. This has to be selected carefully. It should not happen that there is such a data skew that all your requests are hitting one partition and thus that partition is having high usage and others are not. To mitigate this and have equal data distribution, their partition key was formed by combining multiple attributes. They pulled out attributes like merchant ID, payout cycle, business vertical and simply joined them with a separator between them. This became their key. Since there was multiple keys and tables in their original RDBMS design, something like this was needed. You can see that the data is being denormalized to fit a new data model. Now they might need a lot more kinds of queries which might not fit the current primary key that we have. Thus, they have similar keys called global secondary index in DynamoDB. This is like secondary index in any uh, regular databases, but this also determines how the data would be distributed across nodes in DynamoDB. In this case, they used a number called division number from their use case and attached it with the index key to get the partition key of the global secondary index. Now, like the primary index for global secondary index too, you'll have to give them a partition key and a sort key. You see the pattern remains. They took multiple attributes from the RDBMS design and combined it to make a key. So not only for the primary key, they also did it for the global secondary index. This brought them great cost savings and performance improvements. The latency came down by 90% and they got 50% reduction in cost. So in this case, moving from on-prem to cloud gave them cost savings, which might not always be the case. There are many companies doing the opposite. This was due to the nature of their on-prem deployment and their use case. Also due to the fact that they needed to over provision their servers for scale. So don't take case studies to be absolute truths, but learn for specific use cases. It's not about on-prem versus cloud or TIDB versus DynamoDB, but use case versus use case. That's it for today. Do leave a like and subscribe to the channel if you want more engineering videos like this. See you in the next one.